Is it now? It's live. Thank they you. My husband will complain if you'd rather not do so much of me. But so you I'm going to go right ahead and introduce my next writer, whom I just really enjoyed curating her story and bringing it to you. Donny Chaudhry. Join me on stage, please. So, Dr. Chaudhry is actually a professor of sociology, and she is not new to the stage in that sense. But, Tony, have you ever told a story? Um, sometimes to myself, and I was like, you know, <laughs> childhood, no, not, never like this, not never ever. like this. And thank you so much for sharing yours with us. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Lala and Adishri. So many stories, you've been here 20 years? 70, 70. 70, 20 years. What made you pick the story that you're about to share with us? I think um, Trump would have mentioned this before, but I do think that each human being in the audience is an embodiment of just not one, but several, several stories. We choose um, certain stories, which we feel like sharing. The others are like silent episodes in our life, uncomfortable moments, moments we are not very proud of, but moments nonetheless which deserve a forum, deserve a forum like the one we are at right now. So. I chose the story. Thank you so much for everything that's been in the news. I think we all agree that silent episodes you shouldn't always stay silent. And thank you for trusting us with yours. So there, I'm, I give you Tony Chaudhry telling us because of him. I'm going to take you 12 years back to a very, very nervous drive to the airport. I was nervous and excited at the same time because I was going to see M. Now, why this excitement about seeing M? And who is M? M, at that time, was my boyfriend. You see the blow in the face? That was 10 times more. I met M in an online dating site. Don't judge me, in 2006, Online dating was the thing. Everybody was doing it, you know. Charlie.com, part of matrimony for uh, the South Asians. Um, I was in a PhD program which did have social opportunities of sorts. But my dissertation was really not going very well. Didn't have a good relationship with my advisor. A nasty, nasty roommate situation. Student loans, and I think I need to stop here. <laughs> yeah. And enter M, the savior. He was smart, he was driven, um, he also had the PhD. And most importantly, he was a great listener. Because at that time, too, I did all the informal storytelling, I did all the talking. He also believed that, you know, I would make past this very bumpy white PhD. And that was important for me, that somebody shared my dream in that part of the situation. It didn't start quite that way. One of my first memories of him, when I met him at a party, was of some kind of a travel-based conversation we have, where he talked about, never fly dead blue. You know, I was very standoffish, which you'll understand more. I'm like, why? Well, I asked for a window, they gave me an isle. <laughs> isle. I stared back. Isle next to the corridor. Equal amount of confidence, you said that way. So how could I date somebody who couldn't even say an I seat correctly? I sound obnoxious, don't I? I do. I know. And I sound I sound really, really judgmental too. In my part honesty. And in my part, slightly being ashamed of what I was 12 years back, I was judgmental. Um, I thought I was very, very Western from my very Indian point of view. I watched MTV back in India. I wore t-shirt and jeans all the time. And uh, I even read Edit Lighten when I was five years old. How more Western can you be, right? <laughs> and M himself reinforced some of my biases. You see, he was from 
the very rural roots of Maharashtra. He worked very, very hard to be where he is. And he could only praise by English, apologize for his accent, and in my very, very cruel, insensitive ways, I accepted his apologies. As if those of us who were convent educated had the right to judge everybody else. As if it wasn't just the accident of birth that we were there, right? <coughs> Look at it this way though. At that time in 2006, he had more money, more academic credentials, he was more established. Huh. So much for my convent education, what do you think? In the United States though, one thing which we realize is Islays and I, South Suburban Kolkata or rural Maharashtra didn't really matter. What mattered was we were immigrants who was trying to basically make a tree and work together towards achieving that tree. So no matter where you came from, you were drawn to each other based on your little, little similarities. And I call that a flattening project. You might be wondering, what am I talking about? You know, what could I have in common with somebody who was so, so different? I'm talking about being very excited about bhindi masala over pizza. Um, I'm talking about asking the butcher. Now, this is exactly how I want the fish to be cut, like, you know, a steak. Because I'm going to make a fish curry, Bengali fish curry. And then there was a Maharashtrian fish curry, which was a little different, but nonetheless, Bengalis and Maharashtrians are very, very snobbish about how they cook their fish. <laughs> and it was about kind of dressing up beautifully for Diwali, because not that we didn't get too many invitations for Halloween parties that time, it was also some, you know, it was a concept which wasn't quite, quite familiar to us. However, irrespective of all the promises that Flattening Project had, let's think about that nervous drive to the airport I was talking about. One thing which I didn't mention before was M was in the final stages of getting a divorce. He was separated from his wife. He also lost his father during the trip to India and seemed a little reclusive. During these moments, the what if question kept mushrooming in my head. What if there was pressure from his family to reunite with his wife? What if he had planned this revenge of the rural nerd on the Western city brat all along? <laughs> and what if I had been the biggest fool? I wasn't quite imagining this, but something, something was terribly wrong. You know, you can see that a thread is broken. We drove back from the airport in silence, and gradually the days into weeks, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to go and confront him. So I asked him, what is it then? What's going on in our usual coffee shop? And um, he was quiet for a second. He's like, I told you, you know my life story. I wasn't going to let it go. I was like, I don't think you did. I think there's more to it. And he was quiet again and said, it is because of him. I was like, who? Your father? You know, this was the very Bollywood part of me, which was imagining that he made some promises to his father on, you know, the deathbed. And his father was probably like, please get rid of that Bengali woman. Please bring back my Maharashtrian wife back into the sea. Us Mangalam ka hatao, maybe bahu ko wapas lao. Shook his head, he's like, no, that's not the reason. I paused for a second too and I said, you know what, M, you can tell me what the reason is. He smiled, hesitated and smiled back and was like, it's because of him. It's because of my three-year-old son. M had a son. I mean, I knew about a wife, but he had a son. Wow, so M could lie after all. You know, you know when dreams die, you really don't know what, what hurts more. Is it the death of the dream or the fact that he was stupid, stupid enough to dream in the first place? 
Let me talk to you about my comeback, coping mechanism known as formally. That was quite the comedy. I cut my hair really, really short like G.I. Jane. It couldn't be any shorter. I pierced my nose, it hurt like hell. I wore a nose ring for 12 years after that. And the biggest surprise of it all, I failed an exam. I talked about a bad PhD, but failing an exam. And just like that, I realized that, you know, I had to keep growing my hair. I would have to keep wearing that nose pain too. And I had to pass that exam because my visa status was high to my student status. I had to kind of move on. And one day, just like that, I did. I did move on. Two years down the line, I met my significant other. We were from the same background, spoke the same language. And why that really mattered to me is when now I reflect back on my days with him. It is, of course, it is, of course, surprising that, you know, we broke up. But it is even more surprising sometimes that we kind of came together in the first place. Remember the planning project I was talking about? That we were so different from each other? Would we have met in India? If we would have met, would this have blossomed into a relationship? And if this would have blossomed into a relationship, would it have gone at least for the four or five months it did? You know why I say this? Remember the gossipy circle of mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and cousins? Somebody would have outed him. Somebody would have just brought the fact out that he had a son. And this is not all very, this is not all very critical. Because, because M was very diligent, he was sincere. Had I known that he had a son, I would have never, ever imagined that he was so close to a divorce. Because blood is thicker than water, and I realized that. So I don't have many answers from the fall and summer of 2006, and I probably never will. And the water moments have now been replaced by some maybes. Maybe he did care for me after all. Maybe he was just looking for the right moment to tell me this. And maybe he looked at the United States as a brand new start. So again, 12 years down the line when I was working on this script for Voices on a very, very stormy New England winter, um, as I was putting my three-year-old to bed, my three-year-old, it suddenly dawned on me, oh my god, M's son was exactly, exactly my son's age in 2006. And then I looked at him and I saw his little chest rise and fall. And then I just thought that if I had to, if I had to break a dozen hearts for my little one, I would do so in a heartbeat. It would hurt like hell, but I still would. It took me 12 years, but I finally forgave him that night. I forgave him that night.